Good, good, good. Yeah, I want to I ask you, let's lock in for the day, okay? We, we want to give you, because this is more than a conference where you come in, you get a couple of nice whatevers. But we want to create a family environment for the next, you know, from 10 to 9 tonight or whatever. Just a, a shut-in with God. That's how I want you to understand today. It's a shut-in with God. We're going to seek Him together. We're going to have the time of tasting and seeing our prayer room environment uh, this afternoon. And we'll be able to, we'll probably open up the mic. Nathan over here is going to lead this prayer meeting. We'll open up the mic. If you have a cry in your heart for Southwest Florida, for this region, we're going to open up a mic for some of you to pray. So we want to make room for that as well. Well, good. I am so uh, excited. I have a dear friend. I, we lived in Dallas for about three years. We spent about 18 years in Kansas City, three years in Dallas. And during that time, the Lord connected me with William Hinn and his family and his church risen nation for a beautiful three-year season. It was absolutely stunning as we connected hearts. I'll never forget the first time I met him. He says, I go, what, what's the main passage on your life? He goes, Psalm 132. Well, that's our first time meeting. He shares that. I just start weeping because it's so rare to see leaders like him that has put the ministry of worship and prayer at the center of their church. I go and preach, and I call, I've been preaching for 20-something years, mostly calling people to prayer, calling people to prioritize prayer. And most of the people, they'll get excited for about two weeks. Everybody goes, yeah, let's do prayer. And then it fades to the background. And we forget about it, and it becomes kind of the old, the few women off in the back room who do prayer. I preached it a couple of years ago to Risen Nation on Pentecost Sunday a couple of years ago. And when I did, William got up the next week and says, guys, I'm going to be here at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. I don't care if anybody else comes, I'll be here. It's the first time he said he, he ever saw a line standing outside of their church at 5.45 a.m., and they went into about a three-month season of 6 a.m. prayer. It's still going on in Dallas, and the Lord's doing a lot of... But the point is, to, and just the weeping that, that's touched my heart to see a pastor that says, you know what, we're not just going to hear it, we're going to do it. And this man's carrying a word from the Lord. I feel like the Lord's put his hand on him to awaken a new way that we understand church, the way we understand leadership and the presence of God. And so I want you to lean in this morning, all right? You can shout him down. You can speak to him, but engage for this next season. I feel like he really has a word for us. I want you to go ahead and welcome up William Hinn. Yeah, stand up on him. I'll pray for you. Lord, I thank you for William. Just stretch out your hand towards him. The Lord's raising him up as a prophetic shepherd in this hour a prophetic shepherd for the body of Christ. Father, I thank you for William and Emily and their family. Father, I pray that you would release your anointing upon him this morning, that you would bring forth clarity, and that you would awaken something holy here in southwest Florida, Lord. Use William mightily today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can you stay standing just for a second, please? Stand for me. Let's stand for Jesus, you know? Can you guys just lift your hands? I just want to pray. Just actually begin to pray in the spirit. Just you guys like to pray here, right? That's why you came. Jesus, you're worthy. Come on, pray, pray. Just a few more minutes. Come on. We worship you, Jesus. One thing we seek and desire that we may dwell in the house all the days of our life and behold your beauty, God. Oh. 
of God the darling of heaven crucified worthy is the Lamb and worthy is the Lamb and worthy is come on just keep singing just a minute just lift your hands sing it worthy And worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay. Bearing all our sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love of Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing sing flow now all i know your forgiveness and says in Revelation 7, the Lamb is at the middle of everything. Thank you, God, that in this hour you're declaring war on anything that is built man-centered. And you're bringing us back to the throne where crowns pile at your feet as you sit on a sea of glass mingled with fire. As an emerald rainbow is above your head and lightning and thunder proceeds from your throne. And the only chorus is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In other words, he doesn't change and still the only thing we can say is holy. We haven't come to hear a speaker. We haven't come to listen to a worship team. We've come to look at the Lamb. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We love you. Your eyes are incredible. Let your countenance shine, God, upon us. You truly reign victorious, God. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Thanks, Ethan. Wow. 
I want to honor, first and foremost, my wife, Emily, is here with my baby, Bethany, our fourth. There is an angel among us today, two of them. Bethany's number four. Our life is wild and loud, and there's just a lot of toddlers everywhere, and it's fun. And my wife is amazing. Can we also honor Corey and Dana for leading and who they are? We'd be here all day if I was to tell you all of the stories, the amazing things, the honor that I have for this man and this woman of God and uh, how they've impacted my life. Like Corey said, I, I've been pastoring for about a decade now, and um, my wife and I recently handed the church to my brother, and it's been amazing what the Lord has done. Uh, Corey prophesied basically all of it, but Corey was a huge part. He was woven in the story of our, of our church and our beginning, and um, honestly, I can say it was the seeds that he planted that, that spurred us into a move within our church that changed the trajectory of our church and turned us from being a synagogue, which is just a place where we gather and learn, into a temple where we minister to God and the cloud comes. And, and I believe that we're in an hour where the Lord's taking us from religious institutions back to places of glory, places that are first and foremost attractive to God. Like Luke 7, the woman that comes busting in, she's unimpressed. You know, like there's, you never see Jesus in the New Testament attracted to refined people. He's always, his attention is always caught by messy, loud, weepy kind of people. Like blind Bartimaeus, when all of the, the refined people are saying, quiet down, God turns. And a man that is messy and not put together receives his sight. And I think everybody was blind there. But I think only one man got his sight that day because he had a groan in his heart. And so Corey introduced us to that groan. And in, in our community, we say we want to be like the Luke 7 woman where we all come in with oil for the feet of the lamb. And this is how I think we're going to actually see a man-centered hour fall to the ground is we're gonna recognize that you're all a kingdom of priests, that you all have a garment on. I believe that the days of the one anointed man filling the stadium, and listen, if anybody knows it, I do. I, I honor my family, I have an uncle by the name of Benny Hinn, and so if I just lost some of you in this moment, I'm sorry, just give me a chance. <laughs> if you don't know who Benny is, for the young people, just YouTube it, it's fun. It's amazing what you'll find. But I honor him, I, I've been, I, I've, I've had the jacket thrown at me, all this stuff. And, um, and God used that in that hour. God used men of God like that in that hour. But I believe that we're going from one guy's anointed in the stadium to the whole stadium's anointed. Because we've all been invited in. And, and we're in a moment, and Corey so beautifully articulated it last night. But we're in a moment where I believe God is raising Levites. And I'm not... I'm not talking about an old tribe. People hear that and they're like, I'm of the Melchizedek order. Let's just hang on a second. When I say Levite, when I say Levite, I'm talking about a spirit, not a tribe. Oh, my daughter's laughing at me. She is very distracting. So I'm just going to look this way. When I say Levite, I'm not talking about a tribe. I'm talking about a spirit that Jeremiah 33 says will be a covenant that will last forever. It actually says in Jeremiah 33, the Lord's promising through the mouth of Jeremiah, he says, there will never lack a man sitting on the throne of David. We know that that's Christ. And Levites, my ministers who minister to me. And this covenant will go on forever. And I think we've broken a covenant. And on the Lord's end, he says, you can't break this covenant. If you can break the covenant, it says in Jeremiah 33, that I have with the sun and with the moon, then you can break the covenant I've made with David. In other words, you are not strong enough to throw one millimeter off of the trajectory in which the earth travels around the sun. You, you do not have any strength or power to change how the moon rotates around the earth. And if you do, you can break this covenant. This is how important and big this is to God. And he says, but you have no power to do that forever. Everyone say forever. You know what forever means in Hebrew and Greek? Forever. It means never ending, that there will always be men and women that the Lord looks to who's going to tend to my heart, right? And so I believe that we are in a Levitical, Davidic hour 
where we have we're watching before our very eyes man-centered things fall to the ground and and if and if we've come for any reason to this area and the conversations that Corey and I have had is we're declaring war on religion we're declaring war on this spirit that has been about just gatherings in rooms and having entertainment for an hour on Sunday morning the Lord is chopping it at the feet where the mixture is okay I want you to open your Bibles quickly to, to Ezekiel 44. I'm not, I'm not going to land here, but thanks, Corey. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to talk fast because the Lord gave me some instruction for this morning, and I want to be obedient to him. Man, I love him. Oh. Okay. Ezekiel 44. This should become a staple chapter chapter in your life and if you do you guys take notes here do you do that all right don't just don't just listen and believe me go find it for yourself I think one of the biggest issues we've had in the past generations and even now is we just believe stuff because someone told us in 1984 well this is what my pastor thinks you're you you've got to find it has to become branded upon your own heart so I encourage you, don't, don't believe me today. You don't have to believe me. Believe Jesus, but go find it for yourself. Let it change your life, okay? Ezekiel 44, there's this line drawn in the sand that is that which is for man and that which is for God. And I want you to recognize this morning, I don't come to you as, a, as an evangelist necessarily or just someone that, that has, does itinerant work. But I do come to you with a with the heart of a pastor, with the heart of what we've seen in the local church. And so I, I want I want you to see the greatest thing we can do for people is be for God. All right? It says in Exodus 18, 19, there's this statement about priests, and I want to talk to you like priests today. Okay, I'm not gonna talk to you like we're the priests and you're just the listeners. No, we all have to begin to put the garments on. All right? It's like Corey talked about last night. When one man tried to touch and manipulate the glory, he died. But when it landed on the shoulders, plural, of a priesthood, no one died. It has to rest on a people. John came to, to prepare a people for the Lord. Not a couple of anointed ones. But a whole generation that's anointed. From the 8-year-olds to the 80-year-olds. So when I say generation, all the 80-year-olds, you're included. I, I'm meeting some burn, like, it's the burning old ladies that changed Corey's life. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's always those older ones that have been praying for 73 years. You're, you're, you're included. You've actually made the way, all right? So there's this line in this hour, and that which is for people, and that which is for God. And let me tell you, as a pastor, what I learned the hard way is when people walk through the doors of whatever it is that we're building— they want their families healed, their lives restored. They want devils out of their children. They want kids to come home. They want their anxiety to leave. They want their cancer to be gone more than they want a good visitor's packet. Again, I come to you with the heart of a pastor. All right, I'm not, I'm not coming against the church because I actually believe that we need the local church if we're actually going to see a sustained move of God. Right? We've got to start seeing houses of glory. And so... I had to learn the hard way is that what people need is him, not me. And so how we build for them is we build for him. Okay? So in Ezekiel 44, this line starts getting clear. And you go to verse, let's start in verse 4. It says, And he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. How many of you want the glory back in the house? I fell on my face, and the Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well. May this morning be us marking it down. Mark well and see with your eyes and hear with your ears all I have to say concerning the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all its laws. Mark well who may enter the house and all who go out from the sanctuary. So he's given instructions of how he wants his sanctuary tended to. You get to verse 10, jump to verse 10, and it says, And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity, and they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers. In other words, they're not allowed in the secret chambers. They're on the outside. They're going to be gatekeepers, 
of the house and ministers of the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and sacrifice for the people. And I want you to begin to see their mission, their mission statement is all about the people. And they shall stand before them. If you're reading it, underline before them to minister to them. We're seeing one side of the priesthood. You will stand before them, minister to them, because you minister to them before their idols and cause the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, I have raised my hand in an oath against them. And they shall bear the iniquity of the people, and they shall not come near me to minister to me as priests, nor shall they come near any of my holy things, nor, shall, nor into the most holy place, but they're going to bear the people's shame, the people's abominations, because they have committed themselves Nevertheless, because of what they've committed and the abominations, nevertheless, I will make them keep charge in the temple for all of its work and for all that has to be done in it. Now, listen, before you keep reading, here's what's important to see. Being ministers here only to people was a consequence, according to Ezekiel 44. All right? Just hear me out. The consequence was because you followed them. In other words, let's put it in our language, because you made the church culturally relevant, because you followed the systems and the patterns of the spirit of Babylon that was around you, because you went after the foreign gods and you kept ministering as if it was okay, you actually created the image of the world within what you were doing and supposed to be doing within the sanctuary. I'll give you what you want. I'll give you them. And you'll have them, and you'll be ministers to them, and it might even look successful because thousands of people will be there. We're going to chop some things down today. Is that okay? It might even look amazing because a lot of people came, but you're standing at the gate, and that'll be your ministry. Because all you did was follow them. You went with what was relevant in the day. And then you get to verse 15, and it says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that's what's in this room, who keep charge of my sanctuary. Another translation says, who tended to me in my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray. In other words, they didn't follow the crowd. They didn't go with the system. It says, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me and offer me the fat and the blood, says the Lord. They're going to enter my sanctuary, and they shall come near my table to minister to me. And they're going to keep my charge. And then jump to verse 23, and it says, and they're going to teach my people. Here's, here's the mark of this priesthood. They're going to teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy. They're going to show you what's sacred and what is not consecrated. And it goes on and it says they will teach you how to discern between that which is unclean and that which is clean. Verse 28 goes on and it says it shall be in regards to their inheritance. Here's what the people look like. In regards to their inheritance, I am their inheritance. And they will have no possession within the world. They won't want a possession in the land. They're not going to want to be culturally relevant. They're not going to want the system. They're actually going to value being alone with God at a table before standing at a pulpit in front of thousands of people. And so there's two ministries offered in Ezekiel 44. And I think God in this hour is coming to leaders and saying, which one do you want? And I believe the one where we pick his table, what's going to happen is, is a whole generation is going to come to the Lord's table. Not to ours, but to God's table. You know, like today, even in the realm of community, I think it's become, in many ways, codependency. But the community is at God's table. It's coming to the Lord's table and saying, Lord, we're going to tend first and foremost to your heart. And I believe that this is what Corey was talking about last night when he talked about David. This is what separated him. This is what made him different. Is he wanted one thing. Lord, I want your presence here. You know, he didn't stop after he got the glory in. I mean, 2 Samuel 7, he says, Lord, how can I sit in my house, beautiful home, while you dwell in tents? I don't just want you to come visit my city. I want you to stay here. I want you to find residence here. And so what does he do? Listen what this crazy man you know, like, we just read it quick, but you got to understand, David was not of the line of Levi. And according to the Old Testament, 
You couldn't put on a linen ephod. I mean, that's for the high priest. That's punishable by death. You couldn't put on a linen ephod. You couldn't make sacrifices, but David did. You ever wonder? Dan he's dancing in a linen ephod, and he's of the line of Judah, and he didn't get stoned. Like he had this thing where God couldn't say no to this man. He had this way in God's heart where his whole life prophesied there's a whole kingdom of priests coming. It's not based on a tribe. It's based on the heart. Right? And so David shows up and he's doing all of this stuff unlawful. Doesn't follow any of the schematics of Moses. You ever wondered that? I mean, he throws the, a tent up and puts the glory inside of it. There was no outer court, inner court, holy, holy place. There was, there was no candlestick, showbread, altar of incense. He didn't follow any of the rules. This is what I believe is coming, is we're going to throw all the schematics off the table. And the heart is going to say, we just want the glory. Throw the tent up and put the glory inside of it. And here comes David, and he hires 4,000 musicians. 4,000 gatekeepers, 288 singers, almost 10,000 people on his own dime. Scholars would say spent up to $400 million a year to employ 10,000 people, and their only job was to minister to God day and night. I mean, it's as if David got a glimpse of Revelation 4 and 5 and chapter 7. It's as if he went into heaven and saw the elders and creatures singing one song for eternity. No one was in their mansions. Everyone was at the feet. You don't hear about the golden streets and the mansions at the altar. It's just the lamb. And all the crowns are at his feet. And it's like David saw this and said to himself, if they're doing that up there, then why are we not doing that down here? And he put everything around the ark, and kids would go to sleep in Jerusalem every night hearing, Worthy is the Lamb. I think that that song, they had to have been singing that then. It's just too good not to. <laughs> Generations after David's gone. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years. We read about, I'm sure that there's more, but we read about seven reformations that take place in the Old Testament after David's gone. Seven times, leaders rise up who realize we're not doing that anymore. They start realizing that the high places are now for the idols and not for God. The stage has become for an idol called people, not for God. An idol called ministry, not for God. And so these reformers come. One of my favorites is a man named King Hezekiah. This young man shows up. You can read all about it, 2 Kings 18. Shows up 25 years old, and he comes to the Levites who forgot they were priests. I want you to see it in this hour. And he starts telling them, get the debris out of the holy place. All the stuff we've added. All the stuff we've put in there to make it more attractive. He says, get the debris out of the holy place, and he rebuilds the, the doors of the temple, and he reestablishes worship according to the order of David. And it actually says that he went and got the old instruments that David had built. I want you to understand, 4,000 musicians, we actually read that David made instruments for them. So hundreds of years later, here comes young kings, and they're going into the treasuries of the holy place, and they're gra grabbing all of the harps and the violins. And they're getting the, the, all the dust off, all of the things where these, these instruments were dedicated to the Lord. And it says that, that Hezekiah starts yelling at them, and it says, then the Levites arose. That's the hour I think we're in. And it says, and the Levites arose, and the song of the Lord began with all of David's old instruments. And every single time Davidic worship is reestablished in the nation, revival hits the nation. Reformation hits politics. I have news for you. Reformation's not coming because the right guy is in the White House. Reformation's coming when worshipers take their place. Because there's a ballot in heaven that doesn't have any other name on it. It's the name upon, above every name who's returning on a white horse with a whole army of them. And on his thigh it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, you vote for whoever you want. Vote for righteousness. We don't have to get into any of that. But here's what I am saying. Politics is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. 
And we're focusing on one thing, and the Lord's saying, I dare you to come higher. Behold, in heaven there's a door standing open, and I'm watching people begin to creep that door open, and it's going to come through worship. I actually believe, and not a practical way at all, I don't think there's anything practical about this in any way, shape, or form. The Lord is not practical. He's supernatural. He's not logical. And I think in, an, in the most unpractical, supernatural way, worship's going to begin to take place in cities, and whole atmospheres over cities are going to begin to change. And kids are going to just begin to come home. Like, this is what you guys do, right? Intercession. You build the bridge between heaven and earth. You don't do that? Okay, only two of you do that. Corey, you got to get him to do that. You realize that like, God's raising you to throw you into the gap to pull in fullness of time called everything that's in heaven. Come on, Ephesians 1. Everything that is in heaven is going to look like everything that's on earth. And you're not going to be able to tell the difference between them anymore. Like the veil is getting thinner. Is there any Simeons and Annas in this room that are saying, I'm going to live my life for this one moment? David gets a glimpse. I want you guys to go with me to Daniel 9, and here's where we're going to... We'll go to Daniel. Go, let's start in 8. Maybe we'll get to 9. Go to Daniel 8. But foundationally, I want you to see it's worship. And I want you to understand something about worship. Worship in the New Testament is never separated from prayer. Today, we've got the prayer movement and the worship movement. There's no such thing... In the New Testament, everywhere you see, and they dedicated themselves to prayer, Acts 2.42. That word in Greek is worship, prayer. It's that which is vertical. You know that when you pray, you're not praying to people, you're praying to God. See, the problem is, is mixture came into worship. And it's no longer for, pe for God, it's for people now, in the name of God. It's the mixture. We're going to talk about the mixture today. But, but you've never seen them separated. Revelation 8, it says that angels gather up. When we gather in a room like this, how many of you enjoyed worship so far? It's been incredible. When angels, when worship is taking place, that angels come and they gather up, it says the incense of the saints. You know what incense means? Prayer and worship. They gather up the prayer and the worship, and it says they lay it before the throne. And it says heaven goes silent for half an hour. Anyone ever read that? Like, God's like, oh, look, they're singing to me. Shh. And it says that he allows the angels to grab fire from the altar and pour it back to the earth. Incense. It's incense that is going to be the bridge between heaven and earth. It's prayer and worship. It's God's going to build a house of David. I kept seeing this vision while Corey was ministering last night. There's a house of David that God's building in the spirit. And it's not just going to be this church and that church and this ministry and that ministry, but a place where we can come together and begin to sing psalms and hymns in one accord. Okay. So you get to Daniel chapter 8. And, I, and my job today from the Lord, I felt like he said, give them ammo. That's what I heard. You know, you're, you're, you intercede. You're intercessors. You came to this conference. You know that the Nashorite conference is about intercession. Okay. So I want to give you a target today. Is that okay? I want to give you a target to bring before the Lord. And I want to talk about the spirit of Babylon. And then we're going to worship the spirit of Babylon out. Is that cool? Okay. Daniel chapter 8, go to verse 11. And I just want to set this up. I think that there's something to Daniel Nash. And I think the Lord's raising Daniel's in the Nashorite movement. But Daniel... I'm sorry, I'm talking about Daniel Nash now. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel has this vision. And in the vision, he sees these, these demonic kings and these demonic kingdoms. And, and when you read this, I want you to think he's in Babylon. And he's, and he's seeing the spirit of Babylon that will cover the whole earth. Okay? And it gets to, to verse 11, and it says, And he even exalted himself. He's talking about this king, this evil king. But I want you to think spirit. All right, we're not talking just a person. Everyone say spirit. Okay, so he's prophesying something in the spirit. So he sees this, this high prince of hosts. And by him, daily sacrifices were taken away. I want you to underline that. By this spirit, daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. 
because of the transgression. An army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. So this spirit is coming against daily continual sacrifice unto God. All right? And it goes on and it says, And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and he prospered. Anyone ever noticed like there is an attack on truth in this hour? Like the truth of if you're a boy or a girl and trying to influence our children. It's a spirit. It's a demonic spirit. We, if we're going to be intercessors, we've got to understand this stuff. Right? And so you have this demonic spirit and at the core of it, it's trying to take away sacrificial worship. And it's trying to mix your truth to where there's no truth anymore. Right, so it goes on and it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said that a certain one who is speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the hosts to be trampled underfoot? So this whole thing is causing the sanctuary to be trampled on. And he basically says it's going to be a lot longer. And Daniel goes into intercession in chapter 9 and 10, and for the sake of time, we won't get into it. But I love Daniel 9 and 10, and Daniel begins to pray. And Daniel doesn't just pray for, for his own sin. He's not saying, Lord, thank you that I am in Goshen. Right? We hear the Christians say that today, you know, like, I'm in Goshen, the whole world's in darkness. And sure you are. But, but I love the heart of intercession that Daniel has. He doesn't stand before the Lord in pride and say, Lord, I thank you that none of that belongs to me. He gets before the Lord and he says, Lord, we repent for our sin. He begins to put the nation on his back. He begins to put the city on his back and he begins to intercede and ask God for repentance. And he moves God's heart and an angel is sent to him named Gabriel. The same one that comes to Mary. This man had a, had a fullness of time anointing on him. And the angel comes and I love chapter 10. It says, from the time you set your heart, Daniel... To intercede from the time you gave your your heart to this your voice echoed through the chambers of heaven you don't need a stage and I've come to tell you chapter 9 says this is the first message Daniel got from Gabriel and I've come to tell you you are greatly loved Wow and then he left so what does Daniel do he keeps praying and then you get to chapter 10 and he says from the moment you set your heart to pray from that moment, he says, I came because of your words. Have we, do we, can we say that he's coming to our cities because of our words? Or are we not even asking? I mean, I remember when the Lord broke out in Dallas and I got up and, well, I actually called Corey the week before and I said, hey, and this is such like a Corey move. You'll know what I mean when I say this. I said, I'm struggling, bro. I remember I was on a walk and I'm like crying and and the church was doing great. It was big. It was there was everything that the West would say is successful. But as a pastor, I felt empty. I felt like and this is where many pastors are. They're on an island. They're lonely. They don't know who to go to. We need fathers like this. This is a spiritual father in my life. And I called him and I said, I'm struggling. I don't even like want to go on Sunday. Just being honest. Because there's no power like the Bi the Bible I read is preach the kingdom of God and, everyone say and, and, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. Where is that today? And I'm looking at myself going, when's the last time someone manifested in church? I mean, are the devils enjoying the meeting? What's happening here? I'm, I'm talking about me now. I'm bothered. Worship sounds good, but God, where are you at? So you got to understand, in 1 Chronicles 13, they were worshiping with all their might. It probably sounded amazing, but someone still died. You know what the difference was in chapter 15? Not only did they put it on the shoulders of a priesthood, David says, we found a skillful worshiper to lead us. That word skillful is not like the best player. That word skillful in Hebrew is they found a discerning one. In other words, they put leaders in charge who knew what he liked and what he didn't like. And so, so I'm, I'm bothered. I'm like, Lord, if another 500 people come and you don't, I'm quitting. And I called Corey, and this is, is Corey's response to me. I'm expecting him to give him some sort of strategy, do this instead of this. And Corey goes, this is God's gift to you. I'm like, what is, this is a terrible gift. 
I don't even understand what you're talking about, Corey. Give me direction. This is the direction. God's developing a groan on the inside of you. And for two years was daring me to pray. And I'm like, yeah, we will once we get a building. And then we got the building. We still weren't praying. Right? Because we, we think everything is works today. Like we think pursuing God is works today. We think rest is circumstantial. <laughs> Anyone ever read Matthew 7? Like, difficult is the way. It says, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many find it. How sad. Then it says, narrow is the gate. You know what narrow means? Pressure. That's what it means in Greek. Pressure is the name of the gate. And narrow, difficult is the way that leads to life. And few find it. I dare you to pray, Lord, make me the few. Let me tell you what rest is. Rest is Acts 16, a man, two men are pr in prison, chained to the floor. And they don't care. They're singing hymns to God. And Paul and Silas, not only does, does their gate open, but the whole jail opens up. That's called rest. Rest is Peter's in prison on the floor with 16 soldiers watching over him. And he's sleeping in a deep sleep. How many of you would be in jail, in prison? You just got there and you take a nap. You had some time off from God. And he wakes up and the chains fall off and he just walks out of the prison. That's called rest. Rest is Paul gets shipwrecked as he's promised from God to go to Rome. Think about it. Like, Paul, you're going to go to Rome. He gets on a boat. He's excited. It's going to happen. Hey, Paul, by the way. You're going to shipwreck. You're going to lose everything, but you won't lose your life. You'll be fine. <laughs> Paul swims to an island called Malta, and he doesn't complain about his life and go to 16 sessions of inner healing. <laughs> Let's talk real. I mean, he try, he's just trying to get warm. He makes a fire. Oh, a viper comes out and bites him just to make his day better. But let me tell you what a man of rest looks like. He shakes it off back into the fire. Nothing happens to him, and then he prays for somebody. They get healed, and a whole revival breaks out in Malta. You see, we've got to, we got to oh, help us, Jesus. We're so dainty today and weak. And, and, and who's going to go to Malta? Difficult is the way. Re revival couldn't have broken out on Malta if, he couldn't, if Paul didn't go. You see, rest is not we sit back and do nothing. Rest gives me the confidence that I can run and not grow weary. Come on. Rest is I will mount up on wings like eagles. And I'm gonna, you know why it's eagles? Because eagles use the storm to get higher. It's not going to take you out. Are you kidding me? Like we're so worried about bills. And he's hanging planets on nothing. First message I ever heard Corey preach in my church. The knowledge of, of the holy God. Sneezing. His sneezings cause light. Like he's sneezing and galaxies are born. And we're worried about stuff. And all the power and all the glory, all the wonder that he is. Scientists said we've discovered 4 to 6% of the universe. You know why? Because they can't get to 7 because the universe is still growing at the speed of light in every direction. Consider this. God says let there be light one time. He's got to tell us 43 times, and then we fleece him. But he says to creation, let there be light once. And it's still listening to him at the speed of light in every direction. And we're, like, stressed. It's silly, isn't it? It's because we, we're not vertical anymore. We're not looking at him. And we're building things in his name, but he's not present. So I call Corey. I'm like, bro. And he said, let the groan rise, you know? I'm like, I don't, you always talk about this. What does this mean, this groan? You want me to yell? You know, I don't. And so I said, I got it. I, I, I got I to pray. I got to get the church to pray. But I mean, it's crazy. It's like, we think it's so complicated. And I got up and, and I said, um, guys, we're going to, I'll be here at six. I thought like three people were going to come. My brother and then some staff members because they have to. But I told the sound guys, I told the worship team, I'm going to do the sound. And I really came prepared to do sound. I had Eric Gilmore tracks. That's all I had, the pads. And, and I was, I was going to do the pad. I didn't even know how to turn it on. I had someone teach me how to turn it on on Sunday. 
And I show up, and there's a line outside of the building, and 90% of our church comes at 6 a.m., and the whole worship team, and, the, and they said, they said that day, you don't understand, we've been asking God for this, can we play? And we had full bands at 4.30 in the morning showing up, and I'm sitting around going, I didn't realize they were this hungry. People are hungry. We're just not giving them anything to be hungry with. And then this went on. We started having it in the morning and at night from June to September. And I've ne we, all the miracles I wanted to see, they didn't happen until we began to look at God. And I told Corey, I said, we listened and it worked. <laughs> it worked. You know, Matthew 10 talks about if you receive a prophet, in the name of a prophet, you receive his reward. So we received him and we got his reward, prayer. And it worked. If you're a pastor in here, I dare you, wake up early and pray. It's really simple. That's the wineskin. You want to know the new wineskin? Talk to God. Sing songs to God. Don't build sets around people. Build them for God. All right. Let's get back to this. So this spirit of Babylon, I want you to go to Genesis 11. Let's go just on a quick journey together. Daniel's fighting, this intercessor is fighting this spirit. And again, I want you to remember the mark of, the, of what it's coming against is daily sacrifices. Sacrificial worship, all right? Sacrificial worship, and it's trampling on the sanctuary. It's a spirit. You get to Genesis 11, you guys there? Let's go quick. All right. Now the whole earth had become one language and one speech. Verse 1. Now we're in verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, let us come and build bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, come, let us build ourselves. I want you to underline ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Stop. That spirit is about this one thing. Make a name for yourself. Let us make a name for ourselves. And it goes on and it says, lest we be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is and this is what they began to do. Now nothing they purpose to do will be held from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad and from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, the name was called Babel. And Babylon is born. Because there the Lord confused the language and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. That word Babylon means confusion. It means mixture. The spirit of Babylon is where you find mixture. Remember Ezekiel 44. The mark of priesthood is there's no mixture. The mark of priesthood is this is sacred and this is not. This is holy and this is not. Like, I, I want to ask pastors, when's the last... People think, like, I want to give a political opinion. Forget your political opinion. But when's the last time you got up and distinguished that which is holy? That's the mark of being leaders, is you have to distinguish holiness. Right? And so Babylon, this spirit is born, and what starts out as a city in the Old Testament becomes a spirit that lives on today. We're going to read about it in Revelation 17 and 18, but I, it's going to fall. Everyone say, it's going to fall. So again, the mark of this spirit, I want you to write it down, is make a name for yourself. It's the mark of it. Build something that people love so you can have Instagram followers on. See, it seems like silly today. It's the spirit. It's the same spirit. And it seems like a good thing. It seems like the right thing to do. We'll even say this is about the gospel. It's not about the gospel. It's about you. That's what we're watching fall down in this hour. Anything and everything man-centered. All right? So 2 Kings 7, 7 and, sorry, 17, 7. You don't have to turn there. Just, just listen. I'll just go to it. 2 Kings 17, starting in verse 7. Listen to this. For so it was that the children of Israel, 
had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and they feared, and they had feared other gods, and they walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast them from. It goes on and it says, Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves. There's that spirit. They built for themselves high places in all the cities. From watchtowers to fortified cities, they set up for themselves sacred pillars. Now, I know that that's like really big Bible language. But, you know, today we could say we built ministries for ourselves. The act of worship's taking place. It's just not for God. Sacred places, but for themselves. And the Lord begins to rebuke them because they're building images on high hills and under every tree. They burned incense on high places. In other words, incense again, prayer and worship. They burned the incense on high places, but it was after other gods. And so in 2 Kings 17, the Lord says, the children of Israel, they're going to be sent to Babylon because that's what they want. Like, you got to understand this about the character of God. Man truly has free will when he gave them free will. And he gives them what they want. So they adopt the language. They adopt the systems. They adopt the strategies of Babylon. So the Lord gives them Babylon. And so they're sent to Babylon because they wanted to look like all the other nations. This is... This is also the first Kings and first Chronicles narrative of Saul and David. The people wanted a king. The Lord wanted to be their king. Why did they want a king? Well, we want to look like all the other nations around us. Spirit of Babylon. Right? At the core of it, we'll call it unity. One world. But again, this is what they started out as. One language, one people who actually were in unity. Wrong spirit. Wrong desire. Wrong motive. We're going to build a name for ourselves. So now go to Psalms 137. I'm just being obedient. I want to follow what God told me to do. Psalms 137. And if I could have uh, the worship team come, you might be up here for a minute, but I need your help now. Psalms 137. So remember, what started out as a city has now become a spirit, and the spirit is on all of the earth. It's a selfish, prideful spirit. And you get to Psalms 137. The psalmist is pinning what's going on with the singers and musicians. Thanks, bro. In Babylon. Did you use that? Is this one used here? Okay. Just, just, wanted, to, just wanted to confirm. Thanks. Yep. Just didn't all come out. You guys there? Psalms 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, again, by the rivers of mixture and confusion. There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung up our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. And for there those... For there, those who carried us away captive asked us to sing them a song. Listen closely. Babylon wants songs. Remember, what Babylon is against, what that spirit is against, is taking captive daily sacrifice. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of the Lord. Another translation says that the Babylonians sat before the Levites, the singers, the musicians, and said, give us your instruments. Listen to the Spirit. Sing us your songs for our entertainment. Spirit of Babylon. So here's how they respond, right? How can we sing one of the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now listen. They gave up. They hung the instruments up. They couldn't sing in Babylon. They couldn't sing in a foreign land. What we've done today is worse. What we've done today is we didn't hang up the harps. We actually listened to them. And we sang them songs for their entertainment. And today what you have, can I talk freely? 
Thanks, Corey. Anyone else? Can I talk freely? Okay. You got to understand this about incense. When we're talking about prayer and worship, okay? In Genesis 22, the first time we see worship taking place, it's on an altar of sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. Worship is kissing God, and it's costly. Worship is 2 Samuel 24. David commits a sin, and he has to go find a threshing floor to sacrifice and worship God. And what happens when he gets there is they, in 2 Samuel 24, is the, the man of the house says, the king is in my house. He can have this for free. And David says, I am unwilling to bring God something that doesn't cost me. Because worship is not worship if it's not costly. So let's talk about Babylon. <laughs> Today, Lord, I'm going to sing you a song, but I better get my royalties for it. Didn't get a lot of amens on that one. Because we all do it. Now, I'm not taking away, you know, writing books, preaching. The scriptures say you're worthy of your hire. You're preaching the gospel. How will they hear without a preacher? Some songs you preach the gospel in. Go for it. But I'm telling you, in this hour, we're calling backs ones that we're going, Lord, this one, this one's written for you. If it makes a million dollars, that's your money. It's for you. I don't hear anybody talking like that. And I don't think it's the Levites' hearts. I just don't think there's been another way. Because no one's calling them back to Zion. I think, I think everybody, no one starts going, I'm going to be corrupt. Nobody starts like that. Everyone wants to be pure. Everyone wants to start righteous. But some point, you go to church long enough. You know, it's kind of like the Galatians. <laughs> Paul comes to them and says, Chapter 3, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? You who started in the spirit that have now gone to works. Different, different idea, same principle. Right? Like, you, 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 no one came to God going, I'm righteous enough for this. <laughs> no one answered the altar call saying, I worked my way here. No, you came to God disgusting, and the Lord said precious, and then he washed you. That's how it works, Right? But somewhere along the way, you, you, you attend religious institutions long enough. Remember, local heart, local pastor's heart. I don't come to you uh, hurting the local church. I've got three of them now. My heart is for the local church, but for the local church to be all the beauty she was called to be. But you came to God when you were gross, when you weren't put together, when you were a drug addict, an alcoholic, broken, and then somewhere along the way, the religious institution told you that you have the strength to maintain that grace. The key is not to get strong. The key is to stay broken. In our weakness, his strength is perfected. And there's a bewitching that's taken place. And no one's calling it out in worship. Nobody's calling it out in prayer. But we've taken that which was supposed to be vertical and we've fed it to the people. Ezekiel 16 says, I adorned you with beauty. I put garments and a crown on your head and beauty, and you took it and you gave it to them. Guys, we got to read our Bibles. It's all in the Bible. So you have this spirit that's infiltrated a system. And you've got Levites captive to the system. You have at the highest level of the Christian music industry, demonic organizations getting wealthy off of our songs that are supposed to be to God. And ain't nobody talking about it. And I don't care about making enemies. And the Lord's calling the Levites out of the system. So you go on and, and David begins to pen this psalm in Psalms 138. See, the, the point was, wasn't to hang up your harps. The answer is not to sing them the songs for their entertainment, but David comes along and he says, I will praise you, God, with my whole heart. Before, listen to this, before the gods 
I'm going to sing to you. That's the answer. Don't put your harp away. Don't sing to them. Stand in front of them and look at God. And start singing the songs of the Lord. And it goes on. He says, I will worship toward. Listen to his language. I'm going to face you. I'm not going to face them. I'm going to worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. You have magnified your word above your own name. In that day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. I pray that you leave this event bold with strength in your soul to look Babylon in the face and sing the songs of the Lord. All the kings of the earth are going to praise you. In other words, you want to talk about evangelism. This is what evangelism is going to look like in this hour. We're going to begin to minister to God and the Babylonian spirit, the world is going to wonder why are they crying the way that they are? Why are they groaning the way that they are? Why do they love the way that they do? Anyone ever read Song of Solomon chapter 5 when this, when this woman is anxiously desiring to find her beloved? She's looking through the streets. She doesn't know where he went and she's crying out in the streets. And as she's crying out, they come and they begin to beat her and abuse her and torture her, make fun of her, because she's different. And she doesn't respond with, I've got to go to counseling now. She doesn't respond with, I'm going to hold this sign outside of the building. She doesn't respond with offense. She says, if you find my beloved, tell him this one thing. I'm sick with love. <laughs> Tell them that, I'm, that I have a sickness, I've got a disease, a problem, and it's I am obsessed with God. And they begin to ask her in response, what is it about your beloved that makes him different than everybody else? Think about this. They're confused by her lack of caring about what they think. What makes him different, they ask. And she begins to tell him. See, I would say a God of all power who sits above the heavens, you can, you can measure the universe in the span of his hand, became a seed inside of a woman. Because he couldn't bear the fact of being away from me. And the nails in his hands and in his feet, the scar on his side speak, I love you, and you were the joy that was set before me. I would tell them about the crown of thorns that was pressed into his head as blood ran down his face and it says out of the anguish of his soul he saw and he kept going in other words he saw you and he said I gotta keep going a God who left the throne to put on flesh to become the author of salvation that God divinely in heaven is gonna marry me like we're gonna marry God what are you worried about I would tell them that the reason I'm so obsessed with him is because he loved me first. I would tell them the reason that I minister to them, the reason I minister to God and, and I tend to his heart, the reason I cry, the reason I can't help but yell so much, the reason I can't help but have this groan inside of me, the reason is, is because God put on flesh and he came to me and he called me treasure in a field and he sold all that he had and he bought the whole field. That's why I love him. And listen, listen what they respond with. You get to chapter 6 of Song of Solomon. Ready for the evangelism? They say, where is your beloved gone that we may seek him to? This is how the Babylonian spirit will fall. Look at God. Don't fight them. That'll get you nowhere. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. We're trying to be so practical while Babylon's just raining. It's not going to rain South Florida anymore. You know why? Because you're here. David begins to tell them, all the kings of the earth are going to praise God. Anyone ever read? The kingdoms of this world shall be called the kingdom of our God and his Christ. When they hear the words, <laughs> this is where we start with Daniel 9 and 10. When they hear the words of your mouth, 
Yes, they will sing the ways of the Lord. A generation is at stake. When I look at my kids, when I look at my family, my toddlers, I think, what is the world that they're going to grow up in? In my house, it won't be Babylon. And I'm going to surround myself with people because I think that there's a day coming. The scriptures actually say we will look at our children and we will say this one was born there. <laughs> and this one was born there. They'll be identified as those born in Zion. Everyone go to Revelation 17. Spirit is going to fall. And God's raising people that have the courage to worship the only true God. In the midst of the gods. In the midst of the spirit that is running this day. When you get to Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Whatever you're doing is perfect. Just keep doing that. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine for fornication. In other words, all the leaders and rulers of the earth have committed adultery with this woman called Babylon. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast when she was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Remember what started in Genesis 11 was something that seemed not that big of a deal. Let's make a name for ourselves. Revelation 17, the whole world has gotten married to this spirit. The mother of harlots of the abominations of the earth. And I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints. She's drunk with the blood of the church. And no one is talking about it. Everything, listen, be careful if all the messages you hear behind a pulpit is about how you can have a better life. Jesus hung on a tree and then said, I've given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. Now you can walk the difficult way. Don't run from the storm. She's got the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. It's beautiful. Listen. It's seductive. It's do this for the Lord. Look at the millions of people who like this. Look at the influence, influence you're having. With great amazement, John beheld her. And the angel says, why do you marvel? I'd love to ask the church, why are you marveling at her beauty? I tell you a mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her of the seven and he begins to explain it and he says here is the mind which has wisdom the seven heads are the seven mountains which the woman sits on we've all heard the seven you know mountains of influence within the world this is saying that she sits on all of them she has dominion over all of them there are also seven kings five have fallen and one and the other has not yet come and he begins to say the ten horns, which are the ten kings we're talking about leadership we're talking about nations guys we got to think bigger than just our little thing we're talking like cosmic level. And it says that, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And you get to chapter 18. It says, after these things, I saw another angel coming from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. This is what's coming. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her wrath, the fornication, but the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich on the abundance of her, lu of her luxury. And it goes on and says, I heard with another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. 
lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God remembered her iniquity. And it goes on, and it says in verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed this fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and laminate for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance in the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour she will be judged. Guys, we're talking about in one hour Babylon will fall. Talk about urgency. In one hour, it says Babylon is going to fall. And it goes on and it begins to tell us that, the, that we will weep, that people are going to weep looking at the merchants of the earth in smoke. I have a really hard question for you. And for me, if everything crashed in one hour in America and in the world, would we weep? Or would we rejoice? It's a really serious question. I'm asking God of myself. How deep, God, are my roots in Babylon? I know that this is an intense message, but whatever. We're at the Nasherite conference, crying out loud. The whole thing's intense. How deep am I in Babylon? How much trust do I have in my 401k? For me, that doesn't exist. But, you know, it's what preaching does, I guess. How deep do you go? I'm not telling you to be unwise. I do believe you're going to get the wealth and the prosperity. God bless you. But, but it says the merchants of the earth are going to cry at her fall, but the saints will rejoice. How far out of the system do you have to be to be celebrating and dancing when a market crashes? I, I know that this isn't like a fun topic, but you start getting concerned about all the things you've married in Babylon. All the idols we've built in our name with our faces on the CD. Get to verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone <laughs> and a great millstone and he threw it into the sea saying, thus with violence. I want you to listen. It's going to be violent. It's not going to be Usoki. That's good. That's for you personally. But there's this, this call is a violent call. This call is we're reaching kind of call. This call is like I'm in the world, but I don't belong here, and that's where the groan starts. This call is the Ezekiel 3, 10, and 11, right? That, that eternity is within me is what it says. And God has given a travail to men is what it says in Ecclesiastes 3, 10. Travail to men. He'll make everything beautiful in its time. Oh, and he said eternity in your hearts. In other words, the travail is this. Christ in you is the hope of a coming glory. And the fact that Christ is in you and you have this hope, it's eating you up inside because you're in a world where it's dark and deep darkness will cover the earth, right? But the glory of the Lord will rise upon you and your children. And it starts causing this contradiction of, I don't belong here. That's why you got to be careful when all of church is just about how you can be blessed and you can be prosperous and you can have a better life. Forget all that nonsense. Die to yourself is the way. We have so much self-help, we forgot about self-denial. We've married Babylon. So the Lord says, come out of her, my people, and with violence, it says, the great city of Babylon will fall. And it goes on and it says, the sound, listen to the first group that comes out. You ready? The sound of the harpists, the musicians, the flute players, the trumpeters, they're not going to be heard in her anymore. The first group that won't be heard in Babylon anymore is the singers and musicians. It's the first group. And then it goes on and it says, And all of the creatives, no more crafts, craftsmen, any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of the millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will no longer be heard in you. Again, there's no separation of worship and prayer in the New Testament. So I'm here to tell you the word that God gave me today specifically for this was I dare you to come out of Babylon I dare you to be the first group that Babylon's sound is no longer in you this is Davidic worship it's getting back to him at the center again it's the Ezekiel 44 of this is what we're saying yes to I remember being 10 years old and I'm listening to my dad see we need fathers I'm listening to my dad minister I'm 12 and he's 
preaching on Ezekiel 44. And I remember the church I was sitting in, I'm sitting there, and there's 50 people in the room, and he's screaming his head off. If you know anything about my dad, he screams a lot. He's screaming his head off, and he's saying, what ministry do you want, the one at God's table or the one at theirs? I remember being little going, I want to give my whole life to sitting at the Lord's table, and if we're never seen, if you're never heard, your voice is echoing through the chambers of heaven like it did for Daniel. And the Lord's going to come to Florida because we asked him to. I remember in that season, I was, when prayer broke out and all this stuff started happening, I remember in one service, I remember praying, Lord, thank you for sovereignly coming, and I heard the Lord rebuke me. And I heard the Lord say, you think I like you better than the church next door? I didn't respond. If the Lord asks you questions, I would encourage you. Most of the time it's rhetorical. I just want to just give you some advice. Do you think I like you better than the church next door? Do you know why I came, son? I said, why? He said, because you asked me. See, I don't think anybody's asking. They're not asking, and then when he does come, they're not paying attention. Anyone ever read in Isaiah 64, rend the heavens and come down? It's like our staple prayer for intercession. You know what it says just a few verses later? When I did rend the heavens and come down, you weren't paying attention. He came. He hung on a tree, guys. He gave us his spirit. He's here. Revival's coming. It says that times of refreshing, you know that word, you know revival actually, that word is in the Bible. The word refreshing literally translates in Greek, revival. Times of revival are coming from the presence of the Lord. I'm not talking about just what God gives off and we call his presence. It's not his aura. It's him. The revival is going to be God's here. The revival is going to be God is present. And we saw him and we threw crowns at his feet. We didn't sell songs in his name and then ask him to come. What are we doing? Why don't you stand to your feet? In an hour where worship incense has become a product that is produced, packaged, and sold for profit, we've chosen influence over incense, royalties over sacrifice, production over affection. And the Lord stands at the door and knocks, and he's longing with a request for his people, can we sit together and dine again? On the tables that we once prepared our offerings for the Lord in secret are now in the lobbies of our events that we're holding in his name, yet it's our picture everyone sees. It's the merchandise we created for ourselves that everyone sees. Babylon has become an industry taking Levites captive and selling the songs of the Lord for personal gain and influence. And we're saying, Lord, forgive us today. Forgive us, God, for polluting your offering. And turning worship into another genre of song, forgive us, God, for marrying Babylon when we were intended to see her fall. Raise up Levites that clear tables of polluted offerings and once again prepare the table of the Lord. I think about the Lamb of God, baptized, filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove, it says. The first thing he does after coming out of the wilderness is he goes to church. He walks into the temple in John chapter 2 with a whip that he premeditated and made. I know we all know Jesus as the blonde, blue-eyed guy holding a lammy, but I know a Jewish man that makes whips when no one's watching. And he comes into the temple with a whip and he starts swinging it like Indiana Jones and flipping tables upside down. And he sees inside of cages, pigeons, or doves, that word is. So you got to think the Lamb of God has the dove descend upon him. Sees the Spirit of God descend upon him like a dove and remain. And he goes to church and he finds a dove inside of a cage. And he starts ripping the cage open and flipping the tables. I'm asking for an anointing. Come on, lift your hands. A reformer anointing to hit the Nasherites. A reformer anointing to come and land on a people that are saying, God, in our day, we will see Babylon fall. And all the things that we have married in Babylon, we repent, God. I want you to begin to repent on behalf of your house, this city, 
and this nation. Begin to repent. Come on. You want to talk about intercession? Do it. Just do it. 